living in, but praise God, we're all here. I want to thank you all for uh, uh, being here, for keeping this appointment with God. Amen. Those who join us by Facebook Live, thank you for keeping this appointment with God also. As always, I want to get right into the Word. I only have two hours to preach. <laughs> just joking, just joking. I'm grateful for the salvation of my soul always and the forgiveness of my sins. Uh, for my wife, Gina, and family who are with us today, our pastors, David and Pastor Angela, I honor the ministry that is here among us, uh, those that appreciate this honor that I hold this morning, the Catalyst family that is here, the Catalyst family, family that joined us on Facebook, and those who are visiting with us. We hope you're a blessing to you as you are to us by being here. Uh, and I just want to jump into this. I've held this in my heart for uh, quite some time, so I'm asking God to, to, uh, to bless it, to bless this time together. Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that, uh, that you're here this morning to change lives. And God, I, it's so important that I get out of the way and that you stand in here. So important that I decrease and you increase, oh God. Because your word will do what I can't do. Uh, your word is designed for that and made for that. So I pray that lives will be transformed everywhere. Here in this audience. There in that audience at Facebook. And we praise you and give you glory even now. In Jesus' name and all of God's people say. Amen. Amen. Look into your Bibles or into your laptops or whatever you're carrying with you. At Psalms, Psalms chapter 37, verse 35, or uh, 25. Psalms chapter 37, verse 25. The Word of God says, I was young. Well, you don't have to say amen, church. It's, I'm just reading what it says here. <laughs> uh, I was young, and now I am old. Thank you. Yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children or their seed begging for bread. Amen. I read from Isaiah 41, verse 10. Isaiah 41, verse 10. And the Bible says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you. With my righteous right hand. I entitled this talk, In Times Like These. In Times Like These. Throughout this year, church, in the radio especially, I've heard uh, a voice on the other side say, In these uncertain times, that phrase, in these uncertain times. But then that voice is an advertiser. Wanting to sell me something that has nothing to do with these uncertain times, but, but there it is. In these uncertain times, and they tag that with what they want to sell us. Yeah. In reality, worldwide, church, these unsettling times that we know, these, this, this great fear, this great doubt, anxiety, this stress that we, we, we are punctuated, that punctuated by this overwhelming grief, it's nothing new. It's been with us for much longer than 9, 12 months. It's been with humanity for many years. Our great needs, this list has only become longer. You know, if you ask the think tanks, there's a few people, groups that, that think of what are the greatest needs on the, in humanity on this global uh, uh, place that we live in. And they all crisscross. I got three here, and I'm not going to get into that much detail, but they crisscross as what the needs are. Some needs, like some, they all agree that climate change, human rights, uh, world poverty, econ economic equality, and the list goes on and on and on. They all agree on these things. So many lists, so many needs pressing humanity, yet out of all the cries, there's one cry, there's one need that is missed. 
There's one great need, and, and I, I submit to you this morning that it's probably the greatest need of all humanity, and that is the need to end this estrangement, to end this alienation, this hostility, this schism between God and man. That is the greatest need. We need to end that separation. The breakup came up long ago. This is not just happening 12 months. This kind of breakup that we're talking about is read right over there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. And Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 to 10 reads like this. Then the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Uh, that would be man's attempt to cover up. Okay, verse 8. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, as usual. And that was God. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man, where are you? Where are you? And verse 10 says, he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. Parentheses, never afraid before. He was never afraid before. But something's different here. Something's different. Never afraid before. Because I was naked. So I hid. You know the story, church. You know how this goes on. This story just filled with this humiliation. Filled with the guilt and filled with the shame and the punishment. You see the passing. If you keep on reading, someone's passing the blame. The woman you gave me. And all of this. Yeah, they're passing the blame. And then you see how, how, how all of a sudden a good, great God that is great to walk with today, tomorrow becomes a great a God to be feared. The great difference here. Something happened and it was sin. Since then, since that time in history. Since then, the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve have been trying to hide from him. Since then, they've been trying to hide. Sin had caused a divide between God and man, had caused a separation. Sin altered man's way of thinking. Man's perception. Sin altered the perception of life. Sin altered the word. Forerunner's commentary writes it this way. It says, with time, and I quote, with time people became distrustful, cynical, suspicious, sarcastic, prejudiced, self-centered, and uninvolved. Uninvolved. Don't want to be involved with anything. And that's the short list. That would be a short list. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Romans 8, 7 says, the sinful man is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2 says, as for you, you were dead. You were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you were followed, when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of this kingdom of the air, the spirit, and this is present, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. In times like these, and in these times that we're describing that are present today, in times like these, for those who are counting, we need number one, a divine visitation. We need a divine visitation. Great news. We heard about it last week. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us. Ooh, glory. For unto us. And before I go on to, into that verse, because that verse is so prophetic. You see, uh, let me give you John 3, 16. You know it. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only one, his one and only son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay? Whoever. And us. For unto us, that's you and me. Just in case you're wondering, who is the Bible talking about? It's whoever is us. Whoever believes in him. For unto us, a child is born. That is how he came to us. As a child. A son is given. Notice that it doesn't say a child is given. 
A child is born. A son, capital S, capital S, is given. Why? A son is given. God, one and only son. The pre-existing child, the big pre-existing God. That's the son was given. A child born in the manger, a son existing from eternity, came to visit us. A divine intervention. Him who the government to come would be on his shoulder, as the verse says. His responsibility, check this resume out. Check his resume. Right. Wonderful counselor. Yes. Mighty God. Yes. Everlasting father. Yes. Prince of peace. Yes. I think that qualifies him. Yes. That quali you, can, you can intervene in my life anytime you want. If that is you. But the list goes on. Can we lift him up this morning? Yes. Can we lift him up this morning? Yes. Can we lift him up this morning? Yes. He is the amazing and amazing. He is the astonished and astonishing, the astounding and astounding, the awe and awesome, the confound and confound him, the fab and fabulous. He is the marvel and marvelous. He is the miracle and miraculous. He is the over and over and overwhelming. He is the stagger and staggering. He is the stun and stupendous. He is super and superior. He is the shock and shocking. He is the wonderful and wonderful. Can we lift them up? We have been divinely visited. We have been divinely visited. And if you are willing, invite him in. And I speak also to those listening to us in Facebook. If you are willing, invite him in. He will not only visit with you, he will remain in your heart. If you say yes, if you just say yes, come into my heart, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. In times like these, we need a divine visitation. How many say amen? In times like these, we need a divine intervention. We need a divine intervention. This is when God steps in yes. and changes the outcome of any situation. When God steps in, changes the outcome of any situation. In short, a miracle. Uh, a divine providence, for examples. Uh, the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea. The bringing down of the walls of the surrounding Jer Jericho. The delivering of those three boys out there in, in Daniel some, somewhere from a fiery furnace. Oh, oh, talk about divine intervention. The fact that you and I made it through this year, that is divine intervention. Come on, praise him. That is divine intervention and all. Now, is God still intervening? Wait a minute. I'll give you a profound theological sound answer to that. You betcha. How sound is that? You betcha. He is intervening. Hallelujah. Biblically, um, he is never far off, although we may be far from him. His intervention is a constant, constant, Pastor, reminder of his power and his goodness to all humanity. Hallelujah. The Father's target, what is it? The heart of man. That's his intervention. He targets the heart of man. Why? Because biblically, the heart refers to the ruling center of the whole person. It is with our hearts that we, first, that we are to first love God, according to Mark 12, 30. And then the soul, the mind, the strength, that, that follows. I believe it follows. If that heart is heart to God, hallelujah. Is it there? It, it is there that humanity's need for divine intervention begins. It begins in the heart of man. And I only need you to listen to this. A heart that is proud, idolatrous, hardened, embittered, stubborn, deceitful, listen to this, cannot, cannot, cannot be legislated. No, you're not hearing me. Cannot be legislated to do right. There is no, you, you can't pass a law to change the heart of man. Only God can change the heart of man. You, you can't pass three laws and hope that, that people just follow up and all of a sudden their hearts are, 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 are right. No. It cannot be legislated to do right. In times like these, we need a God-sized intervention that will transform this heart 
and, and, and turn it into a clean heart. We'll turn it into a broken and contrite heart. We'll turn it into a tender and steadfast, a joyful and upright, a heart after God's own heart. Oh, glory to God. Regarding this intervention, let me tell you, God is sovereign. God is sovereign when it comes to this intervention. God is possessing supreme power. God is authority. Psalms 121.4 says, Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never sleep nor slumber. He is sovereign. He is watching. The sovereign God is a protector. He's a provider. This intervention is awesome. And his son, as if that weren't enough, his son, a personal intercessor. Here comes Jesus, a personal intercessor. In fact, more than a personal intercessor. Isaiah 61 1 says that he is anointed for a purpose. Jesus was anointed for a purpose, to proclaim good news to the poor, to put your heart together or bind it up, to br- bind up the brokenhearted, or to make it secure, to bring it under legal authority, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness for the prisoners. On the cross, Jesus intervened when just before he exclaimed, it is finished. Just before he exclaimed, it is finished, he made sure. It doesn't say this particular part. I think Jesus made sure that each and every one of our names were mentioned on the cross. It says, yet while we were sinners. I think he, he, he may have felt the, the impulse to say, it, it, wait a minute, wait a minute. There, there's David and Angela. I'm up here for David and Angela. It is not, wait a minute, I'm up here for T. Wait a minute, I'm up here for, 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 for all catalysts. And he mentioned our names. Again, church, it, it doesn't say that there in the Bible. But that's the purpose. For God so loved the world. He loved all of us that he gave his only begotten son. Yet while we were sinners, he mentions our name. The son loving the world just as the father loves the world Allah John 3.16. Then, if that's not enough, then there's the Holy Spirit. The great counselor slash comforter. Romans 8, 26, 27, and 27 says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes. In the Greek, it means to appeal. The Spirit himself appeals for us through wordless, wordless groans. Verse 27 says, And God who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes, or again, appeals for, the God, for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. That's divine intervention. Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart may fail, but my God, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's divine intervention. In the Living Bible, that same verse reads, My heart, my health fails, my spirit droops, yet God remains. He is the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. That's divine intervention. So, is God still intervening? You betcha. Yeah. Amen. He is still intervening. Next time God intervenes, next time he steps in the church, I give you this advice and please take it. Give him thanks. Next time he, co- he intervenes, give him glory and praise. Oh, by the way, he just intervened. You're listening. Oh, by the way, he just intervened again. Oh, glory to Jesus. Oh, he just intervened. In times like these, we do need a divine intervention. But in times like these, we also need divine reconciliation. Divine reconciliation, a complete work. A complete work. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, I read from the King James Version, he is a new creation, new creature. 
Others say creation. Old things are passed away. Behold or appreciate, catch on to this. All things are become new. And all things are of God who hath what? Reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation to each other, I add. <laughs> okay, reconciliation. Reconciliation is the end of that breach, of that estrangement we spoke of earlier caused by sin. The salvation experience, that's when we're brought together with God. There's reconciliation. No matter the level of reconciliation, forgiveness, and this is important, Forgiveness is a common denominator in, in reconciliation. It's a must. It has to happen. I, and I have to accentuate this point, church. Listen to this with your heart. There cannot be reconciliation without intentional forgiveness. Oh, you didn't hear me. There cannot be reconciliation without intentional forgiveness. Prepare yourselves to forgive others, church. Prepare yourselves. It's your ministry. It's my ministry. It's our ministry. It completes reconciliation as it was intentional coming from God. God intentionally reconciled himself with us. So it must be intentional coming from you and me. That reconciliation has to be. And, and by the way, forgiveness is not probation. Forgiveness is a full pardon. You didn't hear me. It's not probation. It's a full pardon. The debt paid, no resentment or bitterness, no baggage to claim. So again, I read from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 through 20 this time. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconcil reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed it to us, a message of reconciliation. We have that message. We can testify. I've been reconciled with God. So can you. That's a message. We are therefore ambassadors. We are therefore representatives. We are therefore delegates. We are therefore, therefore temporarily, temporary diplomatic assignment. For the time being, while we're here, we're ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be Reconciled to God. Oh, glory to God. Read his word, church. Pray always and resist turning from God. And listen to this with your heart again. Don't ignore what you do have for what you don't have. Oh, you're not hearing me. Don't ignore what you do have for what you don't have. Ever since the power of sin and death was destroyed, the enemy fears you. The enemy fears us. Lord Jesus Christ gave us the victory. And now knowing that Lord Jesus gave us the victory because of this reconciliation, because of this move of God to bring us together with him, knowing this, we read Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No! Say no. no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Hallelujah. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither present nor future, neither any power, neither height nor death, nor anything else in the all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And in times like these, church, we do need divine intervention. In times like these, we need divine restoration. Not only intervention, not only reconciliation, but we need divine intervention. And with this, I'm going to close. Hallelujah. Restoration is an ongoing work. Okay, in, in, his, in his book, Waking the Dead, John Eldridge writes this, and I quote John Eldridge when he says, when you take a second glance in the mirror, when you pause to look again at a photograph, you're looking for the glory you know you were meant to have. Your story didn't start with sin, and thank God it doesn't end with sin. It ends with glory restored. Romans 8.30 says, those he justified, he also glorified. And in the meantime, 
You have been transformed. And you are being transformed. God is restoring your glory because the glory of God is you fully alive. Unquote. Always pointing to the greatest act of reservation, all of revelation. You read the last book, and that's the final act of, of, this revela of this restoration. In times like these, to close church, let me allow, allow me to cut through the fear that grips so many. And I, I'm going to say something curious. I can't see the clock. It's being, it's being covered by the star and the tree. So I have no idea what time it is. <laughs> you get a Puerto Rican preacher not knowing what time it is. I go on. I had to put that in there. In times like these, allow me to close, to cut through the fear that grips so many. Allow me to, to cut through the anxiety and the stress and the cancer that so enslaves humanity. Yet you always notice that yeah, some preachers use that metaphor, cancer. And you know, you know why? And j just give me a second on this, uh, another few seconds. <laughs> cancer is, is, and I'm going to read it here, it's an uncontrolled growth of an abnormal cells in the body. You think this preacher is preaching. Cancer develops when the body's normal control mechanism stops working. Cancer, the old cells, do not die and instead grow out of control. Hmm forming new abnormal cells. These extra cells, sometimes they, they form a mass, and you know what that mass is called of tissue? It's called a tumor. The most common treatment is surgery, cutting, surgery, operation by one who specializes in this life-saving procedure. You just don't let anyone in there. He has to specialize, using specialized precision instruments, one of them being a finely sharpened scalpel. And then in the hands of this highly skilled surgeon, this tumor is operating on. Now, I apologize for the simplicity of this, but it, it's just to get on, you know. And I think you get the idea of the power of cancer over the body, and some know that personally. That is why sin is sometimes metaphorically called a cancer because it contaminates the whole and must be removed. It must be cut out. But to cut this cancer, needed, we needed is an instrument sharper than the scalpel. And that is, mm, that is, in fact, I happen to have one right here. Right here. The Word of God. You know the verse. You know the verse, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. Only the word of God, church, is alive and active. Another version says it, it's living and active. Another version says living and powerful. The Amplified says living, active, and full of power. KJV says quick and powerful. Well, which one is it? Is it active? Is it active? Is it alive? Is it living? Is it quick? Is it full of power? It's all of them, church. The Word of God is all of them. Praise the Lord. It is sharper than a two-edged sword, than a double-edged sword. Only the Word of God with, with that precision can cut, through, uh, can cut through dividing the soul and the spirit, the joint and marrow. Only the Word of God can cut between the God, the godly, and the ungodly. Only the word of God can cut between good thoughts and evil thoughts, between selfless and selfish. So allow me to give you a bunch of word here, and let's cut through some of this fear that you come to church with. Some of you have been living in fear and anxiety and stress because in times like these, and I'm not selling you anything, this is the word of God that's able to change that that's able to cut through all that. Luke 1.37 says, For no word from God will ever fail. Yeah. 
Jeremiah says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Jeremiah again says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and unstretched, outstretched hand. Nothing is too hard for you. Then the psalmist says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take and wait for the Lord. Psalmist again says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Let's keep cutting here. Psalms 27 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength, stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let's keep going, church. I have told you, John 16, 33 says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart. I, Jesus, have overcome the world. Second Samuel 7, 22 says, How great you are, sovereign Lord. There is no one like you, and there is no God but you as we have heard with our own ears. And finally, what can you say about all these things? That's the, that's the question that, uh, that, uh, that they posed in Romans 8.31. What then can we say in response to these things? If God is for us, if God is for us, if God is for us, who can be against us in times like these? We need divine res restoration wrought by the mighty word of God. An old song by many who have been divinely restored is this one. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow, sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. With my soul, it is well, it is well, my soul. May God add a blessing to his word. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's stand and give God some praise. Stand on your feet and somebody shout a hallelujah. 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 Glory to the name of Jesus. The demons tremble even when a little child exercises his faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What is your faith placed in today? Is it placed in the economy? Is it placed in a political party? Is it placed in a vaccine? Come on, somebody say amen. amen. My faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Amen. You see, the greatest miracle of all is not that you finally figured out that you should ask God to forgive you of your sins. The greatest miracle of all is that God has already forgiven you your sins. You just haven't woken up to the fact that you need to repent and say, thank you, Jesus. My life belongs to you because you purchased my life on the cross. And what Brother Joe said so beautifully, I want to just repeat again. It starts in the heart of man. This new beginning, this miracle that you need, the forgiveness, the grace that you need to live in a broken world, all starts when you begin to hold the hand of Jesus. You say, from now on, I'm not going to do this alone. You're going to be my Lord and Savior from this day forward. I was never meant to be a Christian for you. I can only be a Christian with you in my life. You see, religion, religion has made a big deal about man trying to earn his goodness, the goodness of God, trying to earn his forgiveness, trying to earn his walk with God. But true Christianity is God took the initiative first. Hallelujah. We love because he first loved us. And so it's not religion that saves us. It's a relationship with Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We want to open our hearts to you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just sing. Uh, can we sing for a moment? Into my heart, into my heart, into my heart, Lord Jesus. Maybe, Pastor Angela, you could help Brother Angel. I'm not sure what key that's in. 
Hallelujah. What key? Key of F. All right. Brother Joe alluded to this before, and I want us to sing this song. It's been going through my heart. Into my heart, come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come in today. Would you bow your heads for a moment? Those of you who are watching on uh, Facebook right now, I ask you before at the beginning of this service, I ask you if you would listen with your heart. I didn't know what Brother Joe was going to be preaching on, but I ask you if you want to connect with God. And it's so simple, but it's so beautiful. You say to God, I'm sorry for trying to do this on my own. You say to God, I'm sorry for keeping you at arm's length. I've given acknowledgement in the sense that I, I, I fear you. I recognize God's a creator. I go to church once in a while. But I've really never surrendered my whole heart to you. And this morning, friend, if you want to do this, you can do this right now. The way I did for over 50 years ago. You can say, come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. Live your life in me from this day forward, 24-7, Lord. I want to have a relationship with you. And how is this possible? It's possible because of the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. The same Holy Spirit that planted the seed of Jesus in the womb of Virgin Mary is the Holy Spirit who's here with us today who can plant the seed of Jesus Christ in your heart today. Somebody say amen. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and plant Jesus as you sing this song now reverently. Sing it as an invitation to Jesus. Come in softly, my heart. Come in to my heart. Come in to my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today, come in to stay, come in to my heart, Lord Jesus. I want you to just, if you're making this a personal invitation to Jesus this morning, you're singing this to him directly, and you really mean it, I want you to lift one hand and say, sing it again with me right now. Just lift your hand into my, sing it to him. Come into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come into You know, my wife and I have been praying specifically that today would be a new beginning for somebody. And I hope that was you. I hope that was you, whoever you're wa watching by Facebook or here in this auditorium. I hope somebody said in their heart, Jesus, you've been the missing ingredient. Sure, I recognize you. Sure, I respect you. Sure, I, I know you are God, but this, this reconciliation that has to happen, Lord. And if you need to forgive somebody, he'll give you the grace to forgive. Somebody say amen. He will give you the grace to forgive. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer this morning, would you one more time just lift your hand and say, Pastor, I prayed and I sang that song into my heart. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I want to pray for you right now. Father, I pray for everyone who has 
said this song out of a sincere and broken heart and was willing to say, Jesus, come into my heart. I ask that new life will begin. Hallelujah. For the Bible says, if any man or woman be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things pass away and all things become new. I pray right now, and everybody please agree with me, that everyone who sincerely prayed this will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit will plant Jesus in every heart from this day forward. As I was uh, saved and transformed and reconciled in September of 1966, I prayed this prayer. And my life has never been the same. I pray that would happen for everyone who has sincerely sang this song and invited Jesus into their heart. Let the church say amen, amen. and amen. God bless you. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make sure you read your Bible because that's God's love letter to you. Don't start in the book of Ezekiel. That's too hard to understand. Start with the J Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start in the Gospel of John. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday, uh, Thursday night, New Year's Eve. Please come. We're going to have a great time together on New Year's Eve, 730, uh, food, and 8 o'clock our service, Thursday night. God bless you.